What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN Radio. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. What? <laughs> well, give me that again. A program on a Catholic network for non-Catholics? It is true, because a lot of non-Catholics, uh, perhaps yourself included, uh, have really some confusing ideas on what the Catholic Church actually teaches. We would really like to get those those questions answered for you on today's program. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us outside of North America, please dial the U.S. country code and then 205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 Wait for our response and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. And if you're watching us on TV today, you can participate as well. Our email address, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. All right, Charles Beery is our producer, Matt Kabinsky, our phone screener. I'm Tom Price, along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? I'm very well. How are you, my friend? Yeah, I'm doing decent today. Thank we, you. We got a great question as one of those common objections that we like to lead off the program. And this is actually the same question that you hear on the intro of this show. We got an email from Jim who says, why do Catholics worship Mary? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Thank you so much. So actually, we don't worship Mary, uh, not in the sense that you mean. Um, we, and and the, the, the proof is the, the essential act of worship, according to sacred scripture, is that we offer sacrifice. That's what it means to, to worship biblically. Okay. You know, the Hebrews in the Old Testament, when they went to worship God, they would offer sacrifices in the temple. Uh, St. Paul teaches in Romans chapter 12, he says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your spiritual act of worship. And uh, we certainly don't offer sacrifices to the Blessed Virgin Mary or to the saints. We offer sacrifices to God alone, the sacrifice of ourselves, of our lives, and, of course, the sacrifice of the Eucharist, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And this is, this is offered only and uniquely to God in the offering of ourselves. In this way, we give only to God, acknowledging him as the source of our being and of everything that is good and as due all of our worship. And, in fact... The Blessed Virgin Mary worships God in precisely the same fashion. As a creature, she owes her being and all of her goodness to God and his goodness and his grace. And so uh, as a Catholic goes to Mass, which is our supreme act of worship as the people of God, we're conscious that the Blessed Virgin Mary, the angels, and all the saints are there with us as co-worshippers. They are worshiping the one God along with all of us at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And if you listen to the words of Catholic prayer, especially the words of the Mass, you will see that we invoke the saints and angels not as the recipients of our act of worship, but as those who we want to participate with in offering that one act of worship to God alone. So that's, that's the way we understand it. Now, uh, in the same way that I would turn to a friend of mine on earth and say, hey, you know, the God alone whom we worship, from whom comes all of my health and blessings and goodness, uh, I'm, I'm in need of him. Would you also pray to God on my behalf? You see, that, that turning to my friend and asking for prayer is one of the forms that my worship of the one God takes. Mm -hmm. Recognition that God is not my own private possession. He doesn't belong to me alone. But he is the, he is the common good of the entire universe. So I turn to all of the saints and angels and every good thing and say, give praise and glory to God and, and ask him to bless me and to bless you and to bless all of us. And just as I can turn and do that with my friend who sits in the pew next to me at Mass, I can also turn to the saints and angels in heaven and say, come, join with me in the worship of the one God. And please pray for me who has need of prayers and ask the one God to bless me. And that's what we do with the Blessed Virgin. Beautiful. Uh, Jim, we hope that clears it up for you. Thank you so much uh, for your email. Uh, Stephen checked in with us uh, via YouTube. Stephen says, 
Jesus himself explained that Abraham knew him before he was born and that Abraham longed to see his day. So perhaps this indicates that the saints who died before Jesus actually did know of him? Yes, I appreciate the question. Uh, well, they did, but they didn't know him as Jesus Christ, born of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Bethlehem of uh, Judea. Okay. They didn't know the history of Christ's proper person or the time of his coming. And when Jesus says of Abraham that Abraham knew me, and before Abraham was born, I am, he's talking about uh, the incarnate deity, well, the, the deity who had become incarnate, the second person of the Trinity, mm -hmm. um, that uh, Abraham would have known him insofar as the divine logos, the word of God that was with God and was God from the beginning, enlightens the minds of every man, including that of Abraham. And so Abraham had that kind of knowledge, participated knowledge in the likeness and image of God and the rationality imprinted in him as, as, uh, as a rational being made in God's image. Um, as a prophet inspired by the Spirit. In these ways, Abraham had a participated implicit knowledge in the Blessed Trinity, but not an explicit knowledge either of Trinitarian doctrine or okay. the history of Christ's person. Very good. One last one here. Uh, Jackie, checking us out on YouTube, says, As a new Catholic, having grown up Protestant, how do I get used to praying the rosary without feeling like I'm doing something wrong? Okay, thanks. I appreciate the question. Uh, well, nothing like practice to make things perfect, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> so that, that's to, to start with. Um, now, a lot of things that can help here. One, remember what the rosary is. Primarily, the rosary is a form of mental prayer where I meditate on the mysteries, images, uh, scenes from the life of Jesus and the saints and Blessed Virgin Mary, so that I might imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise. Isn't that the prayer we say? Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to imitate the virtues of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And, uh, you know, my favorite story of the, 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 the Virgin, quite personally, is the Annunciation, because she responds to the angel and says, be it done to me according to thy word. Yes. And that's, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to say yes, an undifferentiated, unqualified yes to everything that God has for me in this life, even those things that I find presently uh, unpleasant and difficult. I have a hard time with that. I, I kind of want to run away from the unpleasant, and bury my head in the sand, and not, not confront the challenges. So I need to be more like Mary, who said, yes, God, whatever you want, I'm on board. That's what I get out of the rosary. That's what we're supposed to get at, to imitate what the rosary contains, namely her virtues. Then I ask her for help in doing this, right? I'm asking her, help me be like you in obeying the one God. Phone lines are open right now at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders or if you would like to explain what is keeping you from becoming a Catholic, give us a call at 833-288-EWTN. And that is a call to communion with Dr. David Anders. Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. And we're going to begin today with Thomas in Southern Ohio, listening on the great St. Gabriel Radio. Hey, Thomas, what's on your mind today? Yeah, I got a question, Dr. Dave. I'm a Protestant, mainstream Protestant, and I've been listening to your show for a couple of years now. But anyway, my question is on the real presence of Christ in the Holy Communion, and is that available? I've come to accept that. And is that available for non-Catholics during communion? And uh, I think I know what your answer is going to be. But I'd also like to know about your experience with the uh, real presence once you became a Catholic. And I'll just hang up and listen to your call. Yes, your thank you so much. I really appreciate the question. So uh, remember that the doctrine of the real presence affects our understanding of the Eucharist not only as sacrament, but also as sacrifice. Uh, the Eucharist is first and foremost the sacrifice that the whole church offers to God in a collective act of worship. And the culmination of that is the, the consuming the sacred host in the sacrament of Holy Communion. But the two are united. They cannot be separated. I mean, the Eucharist is not my private possession. Uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it belongs to the Church, and it's for the sake of the, the, the common good of the people of God. And St. Paul speaks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when he says, when we partake of the one loaf, we are all one body in Christ. This, uh, the doctrine of the real presence, as well as the sacrament of Holy Communion, 
are a sign of our unity as the one body of Christ, all mystically conjoined into that one body. And Paul tells us that because of that corporate nature of the Eucharist, that corporate dimension, that proper disposition for the Eucharist includes that we not be at enmity with anyone and that we agree on everything. Because we're making a common act of faith and a common act of worship. So we profess the same faith and we purify ourselves. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 7 says we should purify ourselves from everything that contaminates flesh and spirit out of reverence for God. So I have to have love towards my brother. I have to agree with him about everything. And I have to be morally prepared. And we have a way of doing that. It's called sacramental confession, the, the sacrament of, the, of, uh, of reconciliation, where I confess my sins, receive absolution. All of that is necessary. Common profession of faith, moral preparation, uh, agreement uh, with the body of Christ is necessary for the proper disposition to benefit from the Eucharist. And absent those conditions, St. Paul tells us, that to receive Holy Communion without those conditions is actually spiritually dangerous. And so for that reason, the Church does not uh, licitly give Holy Communion to non-Catholics most of the time. There are a few exceptions. Uh, because the Church can't verify that these people are properly disposed. And so the, the way to be sure that you can safely go to Holy Communion is you submit yourself to the jurisdiction and the judgment of the Church. You go to confession— the priest who absolves your sins is, in effect, saying, okay, you're good to go now. Next, <laughs> you, know, you can go, go get in the communion line. You're, yeah. you're cleaned up. You're ready to go, right? Uh -huh. But if you don't avail yourself of that possibility of sacramental confession, uh, then you really can't be assured that you're properly disposed to go. So it would not be a kindness to give the Eucharist to somebody that the Church you know, didn't know their condition. Sure. Um, uh, what are the exceptions here are the exceptions. Um, if you were, say, in danger of death, maybe you're, you know, you're walking to the church to check it out and you get hit by a car and you're expiring in the middle of the street. And the priest knows, notices you and he runs out to you and you say, Father, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go here. I'm, I'm out of here in five minutes, you know, but I have faith in the Eucharist. I was not able to become Catholic, but I have faith in the Eucharist and I would like to receive Jesus before I die. Under that condition, yes, the priest can give you Holy Communion. If you have faith in the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist, and you're properly disposed, in a case of urgency, the priest can give you Holy Communion. Um, but, uh, but absent that urgency, the proper way for you to receive Holy Communion is to, is to be received into the Catholic Church, so that you profess the full faith along with the other people of God. You acknowledge this is the one body of Christ, not only in the Eucharist, but in the people of God, which is the Church, and you are morally prepared through, through sacramental confession and absolution. Okay, and uh, Thomas, thank you so much for your call. That opens up a line for you right now at 833. Oh, he also had a question about my personal experience. He did. Becoming Catholic. Yes. And with the real presence. So, you know, the doctrine on the Eucharist is that it is the substance of Christ's body and blood. And that's it. None of the accidents are there. None of the properties of flesh and blood are there, only the substance of flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And so the mode of Christ's presence in the Eucharist is not sensible, meaning it cannot be sensed. It cannot be tasted, touched, felt, or perceived in any way. It can be held only by faith. And so many people, because of their profound faith in the Eucharist, when they come to the Sacrament of Holy Communion, can have a profound emotional experience because of the strength of their belief. Mm. But the emotional experience is not itself evidence of the real presence. It's just like we sing in St. Thomas's famous hymn, Adorote Devote, right? Tasting, touching, hearing are in the... Dis not, not hearing, tasting, tasting touching, um, seeing, seeing are in the deceived, mm -hmm. right? But what says trusty hearing, only that can be believed for what you know, God's word has spoken truly, you know, if he hasn't spoken truly, then there's nothing true. I'm getting the yeah. poetry bad now. But the idea is the only access I have, the only experience I have of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is that which I can lay hold of by faith. And so one man may go in faith to the Eucharist and have a powerful emotional response. One man go, may go in faith to the Eucharist and have no emotional response, have a, an experience of total aridity 
And yet his reception of the Eucharist is no less worthy and no less valuable. It may even be more valuable as moving forward in the darkness and aridity of faith. Mm -hmm. He has purposed with his will, not with his emotions only, but with a determination of the will to follow in obedience to Christ in his self-donation, his self-sacrifice, in spite of feelings of aridity or even darkness. So my own personal experience was, you know, not attended by, you know, lightning flashes and thunder. It was it was a fairly pedestrian occasion of getting in line at, you know, in communion at church the day after I'd been confirmed and uh, and just sort of ambling up to the front like everybody else and then going back and thinking, oh my, I did it. I'm really Catholic now. Yeah. An exciting time for sure. Thomas, thanks again for your phone call. Our phone number here, 833-288-EWTN for a call to communion with Dr. David Anders, 833-288-3986. Here is Mary now, a first-time caller in Montana, listening on the great Real Presence Radio. Hey there, um, uh, Patty, thank you so much for your call. What's on your mind today? Thank you. That's funny. My dad was going to name me Mary, so that's kind of funny. Ah, okay. Patty, uh, Patty. Okay. Yeah, um, mom won that one. Um, so <laughs> I have been looking, I'm not Catholic. I've been raised a Lutheran, but I listen to your station regularly and really enjoy it. Um, I have been looking into stoicism lately and in particular, some of the quotes from Epictetus, I believe is how you say his name. And yep. I don't know his timeline, uh, but so many of the stoics, you read what they have to say and is there, I mean, are they inspired by God? I mean, um, certainly they, at least the early, early, didn't have the opportunity to know God um, or, or be part of the Jewish religion where Abraham began everything. So how, where did yes. they get their wisdom and so, how do you think that applies? Patty, sometimes people ask me questions that make me really happy. This is one of those questions. All right. I like this question. <laughs> this is a good question. Like you, I am a big fan of Stoicism. I am a big fan of Epictetus. Uh, and you might be interested to know that the fathers of the Catholic Church were also big fans of Stoicism. Big, big fans of Stoicism. Especially in, uh, in Egyptian Catholicism, uh, and in Alexandria, and how it came to influence the life of the Catholic monastery. So uh, there's a second century theologian in Alexandria named Clement, Clement of Alexandria, and he is very famous for having celebrated the virtue of apatheia, uh, which is where we get our word apathy from, but he didn't mean apathy, he meant dispassion. Okay. Not being controlled by one's emotional life, which of course is a very sort of stoic virtue. After Clement, origin of Alexandria, um, in, uh, in the monastic writer Evagrius Ponticus, you will find a spirituality very reminiscent of modern cognitive behavioral therapy, the, the, a, a way of dealing with adverse thoughts and emotions that has a lot of resonance with modern CBT. Um, a, a more recent a, a Catholic figure, he's still old, but not from antiquity, Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, wrote a famous book, a spiritual manual called The Spiritual Exercises. Many, many people in the psychological domain have noted the similarity of Ignatius to modern cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, if you know the history of modern cognitive behavioral therapy, started by a guy named Albert Ellis, Ellis derived this system of therapy by reading Epictetus. It's a, it's a modern therapeutic application of ancient Stoicism. Well, the church fathers were on the job doing the same thing 1,500, 1,800 years earlier. So there has been a profound assimilation and adaptation of Stoicism into Catholic theology, into Catholic spirituality from the very, very beginning. Even St. Paul quotes a Stoic philosopher in his address uh, in Athens, in Acts chapter 17. So lots of affinity, lots of affinity between Catholicism and the Catholic theological and spiritual tradition and Stoicism. Now, you ask the question, um, where did the Stoics get these ideas from? Uh, could we think of them in some respect as being divinely inspired? Well, 
we really have to kind of dig down on that word inspired, but let me go someplace else with the question, if I may. As you well know, the Gospel of John begins by celebrating the incarnation of the divine Logos, L-O-G-O-S. And uh, as, uh, as, the, as the, uh, the principle of the intelligibility of the world, uh, what was God and with God from the very beginning, by whom and through whom God made all things. Now, the idea of the Logos as sort of the intelligible principle of all of reality is, in fact, a Stoic idea. Hmm. We find it in the Stoics, Middle Stoa. It's picked up by Philo of Alexandria, a Jewish philosopher and theologian who was a slightly older contemporary of St. Paul. And there are debates by biblical scholars about the extent to which St. John may or may not have been aware of Stoic, the Stoic doctrine of the Logos when he composed the prologue to John. You have people on kind of different sides of the fence about that. But what is very clear is that the fathers of the second century, particularly Justin Martyr, if you look at his second apology, for example, are very clear that they understood the prologue to St. John's Gospel in terms given to them by Stoic philosophy. And Justin, who is a very, very early Catholic theologian, asking the question, where did they get this wisdom? Where did the Stoics get this wisdom? Concludes, because they partook of the same divine logos, rationally, that became incarnate in Jesus. And he goes so bold, he, he, he is so bold, Justin is, as uh -huh. to assert that the Stoics and the Platonists and Socrates were themselves, by way of a kind of anticipation, Christians before Christ. Wow. To the extent that they participated in that same divine logos through the exercise of a kind of enlightened human reason. Right? Fascinating. Very, very generous attitude towards the ancient philosophers. Now, he, he draws this further conclusion, Justin does, that the philosophers kind of differ from one another in many aspects, and they seem to have one lays hold of this truth and one lays hold of that truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and so none of them have the whole picture. But when the divine logos becomes incarnate in Jesus, you have the whole package in one person. And so Christ is the fulfillment, the culmination of Hellenistic philosophy, even as he is the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. He fulfills the aspirations of Hebraic as well as Hellenic society and truly is the savior of the whole world. Patty, thank you so much uh, for your call. It's called a communion with Dr. David Andrews here on EWTN. Quick email as we're going to break. This is from Joe. I have heard Dr. Andrews say on uh, yesterday's program that no religion, including Catholicism, possesses all truth. I have, however, heard and seen many times in Catholic circles the faith being referred to as the fullness of truth. Can you explain the difference? Yeah, absolutely. The Catholic faith teaches us everything that God has revealed, especially for our salvation uh, with respect to the doctrine of Christ and the sacraments of the Church. And everything we need for life and godliness is present to us in the Catholic Church. That's explicit teaching of, Saint Scrip of sacred scripture, that through the promises of Christ, we have everything we need for life and godliness. Everything we need for life and godliness. But I'm not going to learn Euclidean geometry from the catechism. Ah. Uh. You know, I mean, like, the, the Catholic Church doesn't have a particular purview or jurisdiction to lecture you know, say on, you know, disco hits of the 70s. <laughs> Getting are, a little close to home there, yeah, pal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Had you in mind there, Tom. There were, there were, you know, there's just lots of areas of human culture and knowledge that don't pertain immediately mm -hmm. to the question of the sort of the ethical or spiritual development of the soul. Mm -hmm. And they're good things and they're worth studying and knowing, but they don't belong to the deposit of faith. Okay, so that's what that was all, all about. Joe, thanks so much for your email. In a moment, we'll get back to the phones. We'll talk with uh, Dan checking in from Honolulu, also Melissa in Virginia, and we've got a line open for you right now as well at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986. Call to communion with Dr. David Andrews here on EWTN. Stay with us. Hey, what's keeping you from becoming a Catholic? Let's talk about that here on EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. 
Here now is Dan in Honolulu listening on the EWTN app. Aloha, Dan. What's on your mind today? How are you doing today? Um, listen, I'm, maybe I shouldn't do this. I'm reading a book by Jimmy Swagger about, called Pathologism and Christianity. He says in that book, the term full of grace for Our Lady was a term that was imposed. It was not the correct term for what she is. I, he describes his highly favorite one. There are other texts in, in the church that I've seen that say highly favorite one instead of full of grace. Can you tell me what the uh, doctor, Dr. Anderson, what you think of this? Is the term full of grace proper? Yes, I, thank you. Well, if you want to be extremely literal about it, the word is kakaratamide. It's in, it's in Koine Greek. So if we all want to run around saying, you know, hail Kikaratamine, <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't complain. You'd be you okay know? with that. Right. Yeah. When, when the Greek text was first translated into Latin, uh, you know, we're talking uh, late, you know, early antiquity, mm -hmm. um, it's gratia plena, gratia plena, which is most felicitously rendered into English as full of grace. Um, now, I don't really think that the translation is the, is the problem for Mr. Swaggart. I think it's the theological significance of the term that he has trouble with. Hmm. And the reason why uh, I think Protestant translators will, will inevitably shy away from full of grace towards highly favored is that they understand that there's an awful lot of theological baggage that gets piled into full of grace that they want to resist. And, of course, they have to resist, because if they accept the doctrine of full of grace, as it's been articulated by the Catholic Church, well, then they'd have to become Catholics, and they just can't have that now, can they? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? Now, you know, the, the, the uh, charis in Greek, which is sort of the, the root of the, the whole word here, mm -hmm. um, can't, well, it's translated grace. Now, grace can have a number of senses in sacred scripture. It can refer to divine favor. It can refer to, you know, God being gracious towards us in the sense of being condescending or benevolent to us. And it doesn't necessarily carry with it the idea of an infusion of the divine presence, which is what the full-orbed doctrine of grace does, in fact, convey. Now, other places in sacred scripture, Charis does have more of that kind of sense. Like when St. Paul says, I worked harder than all of the other apostles— but not, not me, rather God's grace within me. Now he has the idea, God's favor, yes, but it's God's favor that affects in him a kind, of, a kind of internal principle of his actions, where what he does, he does in God, that his actions are actually carried forth by divine agency. He's cooperating with something that is supernatural, that's above him and beyond him, right? And that is ultimately the end of Christian life. The whole doctrine of the New Testament is that our participation in God is not merely by imitation. It is by imitation, but it's also by participation. So St. Peter can say that, that uh, we, through the promises of Christ, we become participants, partakers, fellowship in the divine nature. All right? This is something that's utterly sublime and, and deeply transcendent and supernatural. Um, it, Paul can teach us in Romans 6 that we literally die with Christ in baptism and are raised again with him, with him to new life, and that the eyes of our hearts can be enlightened so that we can know in a way that surpasses mere cognition the height and depth and width and breadth of the love of God. So mm. that, that is the fullness of the New Testament understanding of our participation in God. It is a supernatural thing that, that comes in and fundamentally changes us from the inside out. Now, uh, it is to me, completely unintelligible, cannot make heads or tails of the idea that even if you want to say that Mary's highly favored, okay, so let's call, let's say she's, uh, that's clearly true, she is highly favored, yeah. let's get, she's highly favored, and God is not going to grant to her a participation in the divine nature that is the, that is the patrimony, the inheritance due to every Christian? Of course he's going to. And she, if she's highly favored, she receives it to a most eminent degree. That participation in the divine nature that is the gift of grace to all of us, she has in the most eminent way so that she can say, all generations will call me blessed. And she is depicted in sacred scripture as a kind of ideal disciple. She is the one uh, that, uh, that says, listen to him, do whatever he says. Mm -hmm. She is the woman uh, who fulfills the aspiration of the first Eve, right, who gave birth to the son, the son who would 
uh, of our nature, of fleshly nature, but she is the mother of all those who believe in Jesus. So the whole New Testament teaching of Mary is that she's super eminent in her virtue, in the way she models Christian discipleship, in her participation in the divine nature, such that all generations call her blessed, and to her and her alone is given the sublime dignity of being the mother of God. Kind of a big deal. Yes, kind of a big deal. Let me ask you this. Uh, the word kakeratonome, is that used elsewhere in the Bible? Nope. That's it. Nope. That's the only place in all Scripture that word is used. Okay, so that should tell you something right there. Dan, now thank you so much for your call from Honolulu today. It's EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. Let's go now to Melissa in Virginia, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Hey, Melissa, what's on your mind today? Good afternoon. I have a question. I, I hope this doesn't sound disrespectful because I don't mean it that way. Um, I'm Protestant, very interested in the Catholic faith. Mm-hmm. But my problem is with Mary and the Immaculate Conception and that she lived a sinless life. And I, like, if God chose her to be the mother of Christ, where's the miracle in that? You know, it seems like if she, I mean, I don't dispute the virginity of Mary or anything like that, but I'm, if she were a, had a normal sin nature, you know, to me that would make it more of a miracle that she became the vessel through which God sent his son. Yes, I understand your point. So let me give you another analogy, if I might. Um, You know, when you look at a prodigy, somebody like Mozart, for example, Mm -hmm. there's no denying you listen to Mozart's music and you just like, well, I'm just going to close up my piano and put away my violin and give up (laughs) on music forever because I'm just so discouraged, you know. Uh, The guy's talent is intrinsically sublime. It's it's awe-inspiring. And, and it, we rightly declare Mozart's virtues. This is why we play his music over and over and over and over and mm-hmm. over again. We can't get enough of listening to it because it's just so sublime and beautiful. It's intrinsically valuable. And it, it doesn't become less valuable because Mozart didn't have to struggle for it. And, and by all accounts, he didn't. The stuff just poured out of his head. Yeah. Unlike, you know, Beethoven, who's over there and like neurotically banging his head into the <laughs> piano for every note, you know. But Mozart just, just pours out of it. Yeah. The music's just as objectively beautiful, and we praise it just as highly. And we, we look at his talent as something amazing, something worth glorifying God for. And the virtues of the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, th- though they are gifts in her of the Holy Spirit— are no less objectively sublime, valuable, beautiful, or praiseworthy because they're gifts. Now, here's a little secret. When, whenever we have meritorious virtues, they are in us also gifts. They are in us also gifts. If I have any virtue in me today at all uh, that's meritorious, I have it because it was gifted to me by God. Now, he gifted it to me in a form whereby through participation, through cooperation, I can grow in the habit of that virtue and increase. And that's something that's also meritorious and valuable and worth noting. And so when you see someone who goes from a bad moral condition to a good one, we mark the progress as something worth worth acknowledging. But if I had a child and you said, Anders, would you rather have a kid that comes into the world perfectly virtuous or one who gets there by, like, say, 45. Mm. I'm going for the one that comes in virtuous, and I'm not going to tell the child, well, you know, your courage and fidelity and loyalty and charity and self-sacrifice and prudence and wisdom and temperance, worthless, 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 because <laughs> you are just born with these gifts. No, you're still going to praise the virtues and see them as valuable. Of course, of course. Very good. Well, we thank you so much. It is uh, EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. If you call right now, we can probably get you on today's program, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Here's an email that we received from Joe. I have heard Dr. Andrews say on, well, we did that one. Never mind. We're not going to do that one again. Okay. We're, we, we did that, but we didn't do this one. This is from Eric, and it just popped up on the screen here. Eric is watching us on YouTube today. Eric says, Catholics are Christians as well as Protestants. Catholics are just confused and burdened by man-made traditions. What say you on that? Oh, I'm very confused. I'm very, very <laughs> confused. I'm guilty as charged right yeah. here. Yes, sir. 
And uh, am I ever burdened by man-made traditions? Um, let me think on that one. Yeah, yeah, probably I am sometimes burdened by man-made traditions, um, as I suppose we all are. Uh, however, uh, not in the sense in which you suggest, right? Um, because the traditions that uh, we hold to as Catholics that truly lay hold of our souls and, and to which we owe the response of faith, right? And mm -hmm. not just habit, not just cultural habit, uh, are given to us by Christ. And so we rightly uh, venerate these traditions as of divine authority. And I'll give you a couple examples of the sorts of things that are not mere human convention, but are really are really do possess divine authority as sacred tradition. Um, here's one. You know, on my own, I don't think I ever would have come to the judgment that the book of Jude belongs in the New Testament. You know, man, I, I just, I'll just admit to you that if you're going to hand me and do, uh, Anders, which one do you want to read today? I'm probably starting out with Matthew's gospel. Yeah. I really am. I'm just yeah. kind of a Matthew guy, right? I, I really just, I don't really read Jude all that much, <laughs> you know? It's okay, but I just don't read all that much. And if you handed me a list of books, and here, pick the ones you want in the New Testament. Eh, maybe Jude wouldn't have made it in if it was up to me, right? Um, so why do I hold on to that book, among others? Well, because sacred tradition has conveyed it to me as possessing divine authority. And that's a tradition. Like, the Bible itself doesn't indicate that Jude belongs to the canon of the New Testament. The only way I know that is the sacred tradition of the Catholic Church. Now, if you tell me, well, Catholic tradition has no divine authority, well, then neither does the canonicity of Jude, and poof, out, out it goes from my Bible. Mm. Now, you know, Martin Luther, who uh, established Protestantism, also disbelieved in the divine authority of sacred tradition, the final divine authority of sacred tradition, and therefore he was content to quibble about the canonicity of James. He didn't like James, didn't want it in his New Testament, said it was an epistle of straw, not worthy to be included in the canon, and he raised grave doubts about its inspiration among his own followers. There are Lutherans to this day who still kind of get weak in the knees about reading James, and uh, because he didn't think that tradition had a divine authority. So he wasn't, didn't have certainty about the contents of the canon of the Bible. Hmm. Um, I've heard other uh, evangelical theologians who freely admit they understand their doctrine, they understand the Catholic position, and they say, yeah, we don't have certainty about the contents of the canon of the Bible. We just don't know which books are divinely inspired and which aren't, or if any are. Wow. Because we don't have sacred tradition, so we can't be sure about these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, But if you believe that the Bible is given to us you know, as a, as, a, as a divinely inspired text to guide the church in her prayer and worship and theology, then you need to have certainty in your act of faith, but can't do that apart from sacred tradition. So, you know, Christ himself gave instructions about this when he told the disciples, go into all nations, make disciples, teach them everything I've commanded you. That's sacred tradition. He didn't write anything down. It, he wasn't telling them to hand on the text of the New Testament, mm -hmm. rather to hand on what they had received from him by word and example. So St. Paul, talking to the Corinthians, says, I hand on to you what I, the tradition that I received from the Lord. Yeah. And that's what we've been doing for 2,000 years. Eric, thanks so much for uh, checking us out today on YouTube. Call to communion with Dr. David Anders, our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. You're probably thinking about Christmas. You're thinking about uh, Christmas gifts. Maybe you need to be start thinking about uh, Christmas cards. Well, we've got you covered with Children's Rosary Christmas cards, now available from EWTN's religious catalog. These are gorgeous. Uh, the card features the artwork of 12-year-old Abigail, a member of Children's Rosary. This is a prayer group movement for children. They're fantastic. Now, the image itself is a precious one of St. Joseph cradling the newborn baby Jesus. And the inside of the card is also beautiful. It has a greeting that reads, May we give the gift of time in prayer to the child Jesus this Christmas, wishing you and your family peace and joy. It's fantastic. It's a box set including 25 cards and 25 envelopes. It's available right now at EWTNRC.com. Free standard shipping on online orders of $75 or more. So you may want to do a whole bunch of Christmas shopping uh, in the coming weeks. EWTNRC.com. Do check out the Christmas, uh, cr Christmas cards uh, by the Children's Rosary Group. Back to the phones right now. Here is Paula. Paula's in Atlanta listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Paula, what's on your mind today? Hi, thank you for taking my call. It's just a, um, a comment to the lady that uh, called uh, recently about the protestant. Uh, she's she's protesting. 
uh, Protestant, and she was talking about the merit of the Virgin Mary mm-hmm. on, you know, that God made her uh, without sin. So what was her merit, right? So this probably I learned it from you guys, but uh, a good comment or a good uh, comparison is that Eve was also made without sin, and she still used her will to make a choice. So that's what Mary did, and that what that's why her merit is so great, because she used the gifts that God gave her, but she uh, she obeyed. She put them into good use. So she had the same way. Of, uh, she had uh, free will, like Eve had it. So. Okay. Yeah, so I really appreciate that, and I totally agree with you. You're, you're absolutely correct. So Mary's cooperation with grace uh, was meritorious. And, you know, it's a, I think it's kind of a uniquely modern, maybe even a uniquely American idea that, uh, that, a, that a, somebody's moral condition is not praiseworthy unless they start off bad. You know, we love mm. a good a good redemption story uh-huh. in American fiction. You know, we love for somebody to start at the bottom of a whiskey bottle and climb out, you know, and find themselves and be like Rocky Balboa and, you know, start <laughs> out in the dirty gym and then rise to the heights. We love that kind mm. of story. Um, that way of thinking about the moral life strikes many cultures as bizarre, right? And I think a lot of it is due not so much to what we learn from Scripture or from reason— but from, honestly, from taking the pattern of Martin Luther's life and imposing that as a kind of uh, template to evaluate moral and spiritual experience. You know, Luther had this kind of down-in-the-dumps kind of childhood and young adulthood, and then he had his conversion experience and became a Protestant. And that, that model of, like, everything was going bad and now it's going great kind of entered into the, into the Western imagination sort mm-hmm. of as, a, as like, like, this is ideal, okay? And there are other people who have conversion experiences, right, of course, but uh, I don't think that the extent to which that idea becomes like the model for moral progress is kind of a very Protestant way of looking at things. But, I, I mean, as a Catholic, uh, the way I think we look at this is you take somebody like St. Thomas Aquinas, who, you know, he's six years old and he's doing dogmatic theology, and he enters the monastery and, like, he never did anything wrong. You know, he didn't have this crisis moment and yeah. everything. He's in the bottle, the whiskey bottle, or I mean, he didn't have that. He's just always good. That's better. Sure, that, this, it's just better. I mean, oh, it's yeah. better to live uh, close to the heart of God always and never have gone away. That's just better. Okay. Well, there you go. Paula, thanks so much uh, for your insights. We do appreciate hearing from you today. Uh, Estevan is watching us on YouTube today, and Estevan says, If in good standing do we go to heaven at death, or when Christ comes again. Thanks, Estevan. Yes, yes, absolutely. That, what you said. <laughs> <laughs> so the Catholic doctrine is that, uh, that uh, the saints who die in the state of grace and full of charity and, and having adequately purified themselves and done penance for sin uh, are admitted immediately to the beatific vision, immediately upon death. Okay. Zoom, off you go. All right. Um, but that's not the end of the show. Because at the, at the second coming of Christ, there is a resurrection of the body. And, you know, your body doesn't go zipping off immediately. Mm. It has to wait around for the end of time. When Christ comes back at the end of time, the body is raised from the dead. Soul and body are reunited. And then our final state in eternity is an embodied experience of God with the beatific vision. So you have a kind of two-stage afterlife. Okay. Yeah. Well, there it is. Esteban, thanks so much for your question. Also watching today on, uh, looks like YouTube, uh, Howe says, I wonder how many books Dr. Andrews has read. I would love to know. He is so smart. Seems like he knows almost everything in the faith. Uh, Any estimate there? I, how um, many books? Well, you know, I've read a lot of books. When I, I remember when I wrote my dissertation, and that was 20 years ago, mm. the bibliography was 100 pages long. Oh, my. You know, and it was kind of ridiculous, actually. <laughs> and I've read a lot since then. But, um, you know, I was talking to a good priest here in my own diocese the other day, and we were kind of geeking out on theology. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said to me, you know, you can't read your way into a relationship with God. Mm. And uh, that's yeah, that's sort of true and sort of not true. I mean, like, reading can be a virtuous activity, right? And any virtuous activity done in the state of grace can unite us to God. But the underlying point is that, you know, my relationship with God is more than just cognitive content that you read off of a page. 
right? It's a participated knowledge where I know in a way that that is higher than mere discursive intellect, more than just textbook knowledge. I, I know God by way of imitation, by participation, by being reformed after his likeness and image, by having having sort of divine impulses as a kind of second nature, right? And, uh, um, and that's not something you can get out of a book. And I've known a lot of people that were very, very learned in books and not at all learned in goodness. Not at all learned in goodness. Mm-hmm. They weren't necessarily good people and uh, may have had a lot of sins, a lot of faults, a lot of imperfections. Maybe they spent all their time in books because they weren't real good with people. Oh, yeah. You know? And, um, and I, I feel that. You know, I feel that accusation of mm-hmm. is myself, and conscious, deeply conscious of my failings. And I, I'm grateful for books, but I have much more admiration for the simple human goodness of the Christian people that I know, that that have the virtues woven deeply into the fabric of their being, and take no thought for themselves or for tomorrow, but do everything in God and for the sake of their neighbor. And no, no quantity of books can, can give that to you. Yeah, and, and to your point, we all have things we need to be working on, right? Yeah, also we, have, we all, all have things that we're good at. True. You know, like I can't change my own battery. <laughs> you know, like I'm, there are a lot of things that, that, that I'm not good at. And uh, I'm so grateful for, you know, I was in a commission a meeting this morning of a commission of my diocese is doing some work on catechesis around mm-hmm. and I was looking at all the people we had in the room who were experts in other fields of knowledge that I don't have expertise in you know and sometimes they were expertise they'd gotten from books sometimes they were expertise they'd gotten from life and from ministry and from deep compassion for the poor and all kinds of expertise and St. Paul of course teaches that we all have many different kinds of gifts the body of Christ has different kinds of gifts one person has a gift of teaching, one person has the gift of helps, mm-hmm. one has the gift of prophecy, one has, you know, has the gift of administration. Uh, that's not a gift I have in large measure, by the way, administration. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, and they're all necessary for the good of the body of Christ. You know, if the whole, the whole church were a, a librarian, uh, where would we be? Where would we be? Mm, yeah. How? thank you so much uh, for your question. Also watching today on YouTube is Darcy. I'm going to put you on the spot for this one, David. If Dr. Anders could ask God one question, what would it be? Well, you know, I, I that's 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 a very personal question. It, it is. That's a very personal question. I may I may may hold my I may keep my peace on that one. Okay. I may keep my peace on that one. All um, right. But um, I will tell you what, what an analogous story. There's a legend, don't know if it's true, but there's yeah. a legend about St. Thomas Aquinas. Mm-hmm. Thomas was praying in front of a Eucharist. No, I'm sorry, he's praying in front of a, a crucifix, I mean. Okay. And according to the story, the, 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 eye, the face of the crucifix came to life, the eyes opened, and Christ on the cross spoke to St. Thomas. And it wasn't Thomas asking him a question. You know, he asked Thomas a question. And he said, Thomas, whatever you want is yours. Kind of like the Solomon question. You know, uh-huh. God shows us, Solomon, what do you want? You get, uh-huh. one, you get one shot. Tell me what you want. You know, it's the w- one wish. Yes. You know, and Solomon asked for wisdom. And Christ says to St. Thomas, whatever you want is yours. What do you want? And Thomas says, yourself. Mm. Yourself. I love that. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And uh, a quick one here from Lulu. Is there a way I can become a Catholic without RCIA? Yep. Our diocese mandates that we take RCIA, but I'd rather just go to confession and be in. Is there anything I can do? Oh, uh, well, okay. So it's if a little you're, different. Okay, okay. For your diocese has said categorically no exceptions. Now, I, I, I'd be surprised if that's really the case. I don't know of any diocese that says categorically no exceptions. Okay. But Probably you, the norm, though. It's the norm. It's the norm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, if you have an impediment to making it to RCA, uh, I, I think that's that's a good conversation to have. Like I've I've talked to fellows on this show who were truck drivers, and they are always cross country. They're always on the road. They do, couldn't have a consistent work schedule where they could always be there on Wednesday night at seven. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we've helped people, you know, come in other ways. Uh, I myself, when I became Catholic, I showed up at the parish and the priest understood what my education was in the faith and he said you don't need RCA he just brought me in like a couple weeks later and there are there are almost always exceptions uh, but you know, hey I don't feel like it 
probably not going to pass muster with uh, with father. You know, probably not. Um, but uh, but there are definitely exceptions. So you may want to look into that, Lulu. Thank you so much uh, for your question. Got to a whole bunch of questions today on the phone, on uh, Facebook, and YouTube, texts, emails. Try to cover the waterfront here on EWTN's Call to Communion. Dr. David Andrews, thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. Remember that we do this program Monday through Friday here on EWTN Radio at 2 p.m. Eastern with an encore at 11 p.m. Eastern and uh, 8 p.m. Pacific. On behalf of our fantastic team, I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. We will see you next time here on EWTN's Call to Communion. God bless. God bless.